Welcome to the listener's commentary on Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians is such a beautiful letter. The first half of it presents this broad, sweeping, kind of grandiose portrayal of God's work in Christ and how he formed the church in Christ and and who the church is as this beautiful, magnificent display of God's grace and wisdom. And, And then in the second half of the letter, it really turns towards how do you live this all out as God's people? What does it look like to live the the reconciliation and the redemption and the wonder of God and his grace and what he's done in Jesus out? And so Ephesians is just really, really a, a beautiful portrayal of what it means to be the people of God today. So super excited to be able to study the letter of Ephesians with you. In this particular session, we are going to look at the backstory to the letter because every letter, ancient and modern, has some sort of backstory about who the people are that are involved in this letter, what's going on, what motivated the writing, what what really is kind of the backstory, the behind the scenes uh, of this letter. And in the New Testament letters, those uh, themes, those questions of backstory often initially show up in the introduction and greeting to the letter. At least you get some idea of who's involved. And so let me read to you Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the introduction and greeting that really highlights some of the issues in the backstory to Ephesians. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is how the letter to Ephesians begin. We'll look at a couple of the details out of that here at the end of this session. But what I want to note at this point is this, that when you read that introduction and greeting, there are actually several questions pertaining to the backstory of Ephesians that actually are highlighted in this Uh, in the introduction and greeting, and that is, who was the letter to Ephesians actually written to? Uh, It was it written to just the Christians in Ephesus, or is it a more general letter, what scholars call a circular letter? We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes in detail and why that's an issue. We'll get to that here in a second. Another issue that's highlighted, at least by scholars, is the question of, well, who's the author? It says Paul there, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. But some scholars have contended, well, Paul really wasn't the author. He, he, he didn't write this. In fact, you pick up a lot of commentaries on Ephesians, and you know it's not uncommon to at least find some that say, yes, Paul was not really the author. It was somebody writing who may have been connected to Paul and was writing and claiming that he was writing on behalf of Paul or writing as Paul or something like that. Now, personally, uh, I'm one to discount those kinds of debates because I just distrust the reasoning of so-called scholars about that. Most of the time, their reasoning is something along the lines of, well, the language is different from Paul's other writings. Well, unless, of course, Ephesians is one of Paul's writings, and then the language would be just like some of Paul's writings, right? Or the theology is different from Paul's writings. And again, the same critique applies there. Well, unless Ephesians is actually from Paul, and then it would be just like Paul's theology. And so it all just seems very soft and squishy to me. A writer can use different words, different language, depending on who he's writing to. A theologian can talk about different topics in different ways, depending, again, on who he's writing to or the point he's making and the purpose of the writing. So rather than trust the modern experts on this question, I'd rather just trust the ancient ones who were closer to the original writing, who were native speakers of the original language, Greek, and who believed that Paul wrote it. Uh, If you're going to say Paul didn't write Ephesians, it's just an uphill battle. The author claims to be Paul right at the beginning, as we saw, and not only there, but at several points throughout the letter, he claims to be Paul. He has an entire section, Ephesians chapter 3, where he describes his ministry in first-person autobiographical terms as if he's Paul. Um, All of that is tough to fathom if Paul didn't write it. Not only that, 
the letter speaks of getting rid of lying and of speaking the truth in love. And how can the author have any credibility if the author is deceiving the, uh, the uh, audience about his own identity, claiming to be Paul when he's not, not being honest about that. Um, the very first list of accepted Christian books that we have available to us, it's called the Miratorian Canon. You can Google that if you want, Miratorian Canon. It comes from about 170 or 180 AD, so roughly uh, 100 to 120 years after Ephesians was, was uh, written. The Miratorian Canon includes... Ephesians with Paul's letters. And the Miratorian canon, this list of accepted books, along with other lists and other writings from the early church fathers, well, those lists were given specifically to exclude books claiming to be from apostles but were falsehoods. And now you have Ephesians included as one of Paul's letters. So they clearly believed it was from Paul. Um, the reason it was included ever in any list, uh, any canon of official books, was because they believe it came from an apostle, Paul. Its circulation was wide in the ancient world. We can tell that from quotes of it in the writings of the early church fathers. In short, there's no good reason to say someone other than Paul wrote it. And so even though some scholars raised the question, was Paul the re really the author, and doubt that, I just think, let's just take it at face value. Let's take it what the church for over 1,800 years believed. This is a letter of Paul. Now, that then is the first question. The other question is, who was it written to and what's the backstory? All right, like what's the story between them? What motivated this writing? And we see here that it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, that it's to the saints who are in Ephesus. We'll, we'll come come and wrestle with, was it only to them or not? But let's talk for a second about the city of Ephesus, because the city of Ephesus was a really, really important city, both in the ancient world and to Paul's ministry, according to the book of Acts. Um, in the ancient world, Ephesus was one of the top four or five cities in the entire empire. Uh, it was the most important city in the region of Asia Minor, which included much of what is now modern-day Turkey. Um, it was, according to one uh, ancient geographer, it was the largest commercial city west of the Tarsus Mountains at the eastern edge of what is now modern-day Turkey. It sat on a major harbor, so it was sort of a shipping center and trade and travel center for the ancient world. Uh, we don't know the exact population of the city, but estimates put it at at least a quarter of a million, 250,000 people probably higher once you include people who were non-citizens or sometimes they didn't count slaves and others in those population counts. The city itself could have really had a population of 400 to 500,000. By ancient standards, this is a massive city that was very influential because of its harbor and, and all of that. Um, it was a a leading city, therefore, in one of the richest regions of the Roman Empire. Um, inscriptions from the time period refer to it as the metropolis of Asia. So we're talking about a massive, important city in the Roman world. And Paul spent a lot of time there on his ministry, uh, his third missionary journey, because of that. We'll come to that here in a second. Other things about the city of Ephesus, uh, it actually was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That is the Temple of Artemis, or sometimes called Diana, the Temple of Diana. The Temple of Artemis, which she was a fertility goddess, that, um, and her temple really dominated both the the kind of the geography or the architecture of the city of Ephesus and her temple also really dominated kind of the culture and the psyche and the mindset of the city that the whole city revolved around the worship of Artemis they viewed themselves as kind of the caretaker the guardian of the great image of Artemis in fact there was this legend or myth that um, the image of Artemis had really fallen out of the sky and been entrusted with them to be a protector and guardian and hence this great and beautiful temple the temple wasn't just a worship center it was also a banking center in the ancient world and so um, it was you know, a place of banking and loans and all of that money was stored there. So massive temple. In fact, 
Um, the the platform on which it sat is actually several football fields, a large, a uh, hundred tall, um, beautiful columns all the way around it. It was a beautiful, beautiful building that just dominated the, the architecture as well as the mindset of the city. Ironically, even though it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and so massive, so beautiful, only one little pillar in ruins kind of stands in a marshy area at the original site of the Temple of Artemis um, there in the ruins of Ephesus. Um, not only did it have this this massive, beautiful temple, it had a huge theater that sat 24 to 25,000 uh, people um, and had multiple tiers, sort of like our modern ballparks. It, it was... Um, so well designed, facing out towards the harbor, that as you looked out from it sitting in the stadiums, you would have the beautiful scenery of the harbor in front of you. And then the uh, wind coming off of the harbor would push the sound up the stadium. And I've never had the privilege of actually being there. Supposed to have gone there a couple of times, didn't work out. But people who have been there have told me that they have sat at the very top of that theater and had somebody speaking in just normal, not even yelling, normal tone of voice down in the bottom of the theater. And you could hear them crystal clear at the top without a microphone or anything else like that. Just a beautifully de designed uh, theater that was uh, really, again, a massive part of the city. It was located in uh, kind of down near one of the main shopping areas of the city where there was kind of a central kind of mall complex shopping area with um, even a gymnasium where people could work out and some of that. You, you, I'll put some pictures of the city of Ephesus on my website. So if you're listening on the website, you can check them out there. If you're listening over on a podcast player, swing over to listenerscommentary.com. I'll actually put the link down below and you can check out some of the pictures. There's some really Really great ruins of Ephesus. You can you can check out at least some of the pictures. If you ever get a chance to tour there, man, I'd highly recommend it. I'm still optimistic that I'll get a chance at some point someday. Um, there are there are some houses on the slopes in Ephesus that show obvious signs of wealth. Huge homes, uh, mosaic floors, uh, fresco painted walls, and um, Archaeologists have been doing a lot of renovation and restoration work there. Just a wealthy, powerful, influential city. There's actually the ruins of a library there. That library was actually built after Paul's day, about 30 years after Paul's day. But uh, just gives you an idea. We're talking about a massive city with uh, a huge cultural influence in the area. Uh, and so this is Ephesus. And Paul spent a really a good amount of time there on his third missionary journey. He actually first stopped by there at the end of his second missionary journey and spent just a brief time there and said, no, I don't have time to stick around, but Lord willing, I will be back. And sure enough, he was back. And on his third missionary journey, he spent roughly almost three years there teaching and preaching from really about 54 to about 56, 57. Paul spent a good amount of time in Ephesus preaching there, teaching there. He actually... Um, taught in what was called the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus, probably a, a kind of a meeting facility, a lecture hall that was uh, used in the morning or used in the evening, but wasn't used in the afternoon because of the heat of the day and no air conditioning. And so Paul probably rented it for the afternoon and trained and taught the believers there. In fact, it's probably out of the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus that the church at Colossae and the church at Laodicea were started by Epaphras. If you haven't listened to the commentary on Colossians, you can check that out and it'll give you some of the backstory of how they got started. And it probably grew out of Paul's teaching here in Ephesus in the school of Tyrannus. Um, and in fact, in the book of Acts, Acts 19, you hear the story. Luke actually says that, and thus all Asia heard the word, implying this idea that uh, Paul was sending out men, uh, members of his ministry team that he had taught and trained, and they were going and sharing the gospel in other surrounding cities and towns around Ephesus. And that's how Asia really heard the gospel during the three years. And it was very strategic of Paul. Paul, Paul figured if he could get the gospel rooted in Ephesus and 
really get it established strongly there because it was such a central city and because it was uh, the harbor town for the entire region, man, the gospel would radiate out from there and new churches started. And that's exactly what happened. And so that was Paul's ministry approach there. Uh, you can read in Acts 19 about a massive riot that took place during his ministry. And it occurred over the silversmiths who were making little silver shrines to Artemis and fearing that their business would be lost because of the influence of Paul's ministry and people coming to faith in Jesus. You could learn about people burning magic books, that they had come to faith in Jesus and how they burnt their magic books. And that's because Ephesus was really a stronghold and Western Asia Minor in total altogether was a stronghold for ancient magic practices. And we've actually found various papyri, various writings from the time period with incantations and spells and descriptions of magical practices. Not only that, we've actually found some that reference Jesus, uh, probably because Paul's healing ministry uh, was viewed almost as like, wow, having magical power. Because in the ancient world, the way magic primarily worked was the goal of it was to try to manipulate the spiritual powers in order to get them to do something you needed done. You needed to, uh, you wanted this girl to actually like you and fall in love with you. Well, uh, you know, there's an incantation for that. You wanted your business to flourish. Oh, well, you got to you kind of manipulate the right spiritual powers to get your business to flourish. So there's a, a spell or an incantation for that, right? So that's what we found, these writings like that. Well, in the, con in the context of some of those, there's actually one that says, I adjure you by Jesus, the God of the Hebrews. Um, and it, it uh, seems to basically be trying to use the name of Jesus as a magical name that has power over the spiritual forces. We actually see a story in Acts 19 like that, where some people were doing that very thing, trying to use the name uh, of Jesus to cast out a demon, and it didn't go so well for them. You should read it. It's actually quite hilarious what happens in that story. You can read that in Acts chapter 19. Um, and so Paul spent a good amount of time there. It's where he had left Timothy uh, when he wrote 1 Timothy. Timothy's in Ephesus, and he's really getting the church, strengthening it and establishing it even more there. And Paul's giving instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy. And so Paul had a very, very close connection with this church. Some of his later traveling companions were from Ephesus. It's actually Trophimus the Ephesian who was with Paul that leads to Paul getting arrested in Jerusalem and then eventually getting shipped off to Rome. So he had a very close connection with the church at Ephesus and with the city of Ephesus. And that's where the question about destination of the letter comes in. If Paul spent so much time there, and Paul was that well connected there, and Paul knew them so well there, then why, when you read Ephesians, does it sound so general? Why does it sound like Paul doesn't have much of a relationship with the people he's writing to? What are we talking about? Well, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul writes, I have heard of your faith and your love. Well, had he only heard it or had he seen it? Did he... I mean, had he participated in it, right? Like he was there for three years. Or talking about his ministry in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, he says, if you've heard about the stewardship of the gospel that was given to me, like, well, he knows they've, they've heard of it. They know they've, he, they've seen it, right? He's been there. And several times in the letter, he uses phrases like that that sounds like he's not sure that the original recipients of the letter know him that well and know his ministry that well, that the relationship is more hearsay, general, than what uh, it used to be. In fact, there's no terms of endearment used. Um, it concludes with a general statement to the brethren. There's no greetings to one any individuals in the church in Ephesus, not a single greeting, even though Paul knew many people there. And that's what leads to the question, so was it written to Ephesus or elsewhere? Um that a problem is heightened by the fact that the opening greeting that says to the saints who are at Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, that opening greeting doesn't include the phrase in Ephesus in some of the oldest manuscripts. It's missing. And yet the fact that it's missing actually raises another question because when it's not there, the grammar is almost impossible to sort out. And so there's just a lot of confusion about, hmm, and so what's the solution to all of that? Well, the solution is this. Um, there's kind of 
two schools of thought on it. Some people say, well, Paul wrote it to Ephesus, but it had been maybe several years since he had been there. And so he wrote it more generally to account for new believers who had come in to the church who didn't know him and he didn't know them. And I suppose that's possible. It's possible. I still would think if that was the case, Paul would at least greet some of the people that he did know. Um, he would have some maybe terms of endearment. There would be at least some evidence of a relationship there, right, that was deeper than just hearsay. So I suppose that's possible. I don't think that's the preferred solution. In my opinion, the preferred solution is this, um, to say that, Yes, the letter is written to Ephesus, but it's also written more generally because it was meant to be also circulated to some of the surrounding cities and surrounding towns who um, have Christians in them, have churches in them, because of his ministry at Ephesus, right? Acts 19. It was through his ministry at Ephesus that all Asia heard the word. And so there was sort of this connection between Paul, Ephesus, and the surrounding cities. And I think that um, Ephesians is likely written to Ephesus, but also written to the surrounding cities, and thus it's written in more general terms because some of those places Paul had never been, some of those people had never met Paul, and thus the general language for a wider audience than just Ephesus itself. Um, you actually see this sort of thing in the book of Revelation that is written to the seven uh, the seven churches of Asia. It's a letter that's written to the seven churches of Asia, and it lists them off, and it actually lists them in the postal order it most likely would have been delivered in, right? Um, and so I think that's probably what's going on here with Ephesus or with Ephesians, is that it's written to Ephesus and some of these other um, churches that were started out of Ephesus, and thus it's more general, more of a circular type letter. And so here's the backstory as I see the letter of Ephesians. Paul had started this church and knew how influential it could be because of the influence of Ephesus. And that's why he made sure to make contact with the, the uh, church at Ephesus at the end of the third journey. He had spent the first half of the third journey there in Ephesus and ministering to them. Well, on his return trip back to Jerusalem at the end of the third journey, he really wanted to make contact with the church, but he was running short of time. And so he actually met the elders from the church at Ephesus in a, a nearby town called Miletus and spent some time with them there just to make contact with the church. Um, that's why he later sent Timothy there, like I mentioned with the first Timothy. He really wanted to establish that church. Well, now it's been about three years after his last contact with them. It's been three years since the end of the third journey, since his last contact with those elders, and Paul is under arrest and he's in Rome. It's about the year 61. And we know from the letter of Ephesians that Paul is under arrest, and so he's writing here from Rome, it seems best to me, under arrest, and wanting to address the church at Ephesus. Um, Paul has already written to a neighboring church, a church started out of the ministry of Ephesus, that is the letter to Colossians. He started that church there, and he's written the letter to Colossians, and see again that commentary for the backstory there for the connection here. Well, having written a letter to that church, Paul decides that much of what he said there would actually be uh, good material for Ephesus and for some of the other churches in the area. So he dictates the second letter, a more general letter, not dealing with the specific issues troubling the church at Colossae, but still passing on some of the critical teaching to help establish and strengthen the church at Ephesus and some of the other churches in the surrounding area. And one thing that seems quite certain is that Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon are all sent at the same time and delivered by the same man, Tychicus. You can read it at the end of Colossians. You can read it at the end of Ephesians. You can read it in Philemon that Tychicus is the mailman who delivers this letter. And so they're all sent at the same time by the same person. And, and thus, it shouldn't surprise us that Colossians and Ephesians have a lot of overlap in themes and material, even though Colossians is... Uh, dealing with a specific issue, and so has some different emphases than Ephesians. And so that's the way I understand that what happened is Paul basically steps back and is like, wow, this would be helpful to all the churches of Asia. Let me just write a more general letter to them. In fact, 
I actually think he might be alluding to the letter of Ephesians at the end of Colossians when he talks about a letter coming from Laodicea to Colossae. It might be the letter of Ephesians that's being circulated through those churches. Don't know for sure. That's an educated guess, but it's still just a guess. All right. And so Paul writes this letter to the church at Ephesus, the surrounding areas, really to help strengthen and establish their faith because it was such an important church and an important area to be established. The letter to Ephesians is divided naturally into two sections, chapters 1 through 3 and chapters 4 through 6. Chapters 1 through 3, you could describe real generally as theological considerations. Chapters 4 through 6, you could describe real generally as lifestyle implications. 1 through 3 is this brand, uh, broad, grand, sweeping description of the church and all its glory formed in Christ according to the foreknowledge and the predestination and the wisdom of God, and it's formed to be a display of God's wisdom and grace and power. And, and so you get that in 1 through 3, and then 4 through 6 is, so now walk worthy of this calling. Live out who you are. You are God's people in Christ, formed for this grand purpose. Now live that out, and then 4 through 6 tells you how to do that. And so that's ultimately how the book is arranged. And if you were to boil, I think, the letter of Ephesians down to really one message in a in a one sentence nutshell, it would be something like this. It's, it's as those in Christ, the church is the headquarters for God's work in the world. That's what the church is. As those in Christ, the church is exhibit A of God's wisdom and grace and power. The church is the place really through whom God is carrying out his purposes for the world in and through his people, the church, the big, broad, universal, general church. God is carrying out his plan for the world through them. And so it is really the headquarters. It's the centerpiece. It's it's exhibit A, the center stage of all that God is doing in the world is the church. In spite of all her weaknesses, all her uh, feebleness, all her shortcomings, the church is the place in and through whom God is carrying out his plan to redeem and restore and renew the world. That's who we are as God's people. And that's why living his way is so incredibly important for us. And so that is really what Ephesians is all about. And so with that, let me just read verses 1 and 2 again. Just a couple little details there as we wrap up the backstory to the letter. Um, Ephesians 1, 1 and 2, the introduction and greeting says, Paul... The Apostle Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. The word apostle means ambassador, official representative, the one who represents the person of with the very authority of. Well, Paul is not just an apostle of anybody. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Christ is not a name. It's a title. It means anointed one. It's a royal title. So in other words, think in terms of Jesus being anointed as king. So Paul is an official ambassador of King Jesus. That's the force of this. By the will of God, this was by God's design, God's intent, God's will for him to be this official representative, this official ambassador. So he is the sender of the letter. And this is the way ancient letters went, sender, recipients, greeting. So Paul's the sender to the saints who are at Ephesus. And that word saints uh, doesn't mean super holy old guy who had a statue made out of him. The word saint means simply those set apart. And in the New Testament, it's always plural, as here. It refers to God's people, those who belong to God, those who are set apart as God's holy people for God's purposes. That's what it means to be the saints. So to the saints, then he says, who are at Ephesus. And that's the part where we said, well, in some of the oldest manuscript, that, that word at Ephesus isn't there. Was that part of the original? Was it not? Well, when you take it out, the grammar doesn't make sense, but um, the letter itself, as we said, seems more general, so it's not totally clear. Uh, and we've already talked about how I think it probably was written to the church at Ephesus, but also to the surrounding region, and so it's more general in more general terms. So to the saints who are at Ephesus and probably elsewhere as well, um, and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So God's holy people who are faithful in Christ Jesus. They are faithful to him. And then the greetings. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul really does in the greetings is he takes the standard Greek greeting and the standard Jewish greeting, unites them together because God's people is formed of uh, Gentiles, Gentiles, 
and uh, Jews united as one family. We'll see that in Ephesians chapter 2. So he takes the standard Gentile or Greek greeting and the standard Jewish greeting, unites them together, and slightly modifies them for the sake of his theological purposes. So the standard Greek greeting was chirine, which means greetings or rejoice. Well, he uses the word grace instead of chirine. Grace is the word charis. Do you hear the similarity? Chirine, greetings, charis, grace. And so he is just adapted the standard Greek greeting and turned it into grace because for Paul it's all about God's grace. So grace to you. This is really a greeting that's also a prayer. May God's grace be to you. And peace. And the standard Jewish greeting was shalom, peace, blessing and wholeness from God. And so grace and peace um, to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they are the source together uh, of all the blessings that God has to give, all his grace and all his peace in Christ Jesus. And so with that, Paul opens the letter to Ephesians, and then he's ready to begin the actual content of the letter. And so that is the backstory to the letter of Ephesians. Hey, it's John, and thanks for uh, checking out the Listener's Commentary on Ephesians. The Listener's Commentary is a crowdfunded Bible teaching project, and I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who, by your generous donations, make this project possible and make it available to as many people as possible. If you want to join the team and become someone who supports this work so that it can continue to, to grow and expand and have an influence throughout the world, swing on over to the listenerscommentary.com slash give. The listenerscommentary.com, just click the give uh, page there and you can donate right there. All donations go through World Family Mission and are tax deductible. Thanks so much for your generous support.